Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's fourth branch podcast series. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's Tech Roundup podcast, part of RTP's fourth branch podcast series. My name is Jack Derwin, and I'm Assistant Director of RTP at the Federalist Society. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Mark Scribner and Adam Thier to discuss the latest in autonomous vehicle policy. Mark is Senior Transportation Policy Analyst at Reason Foundation, where his work focuses on transportation, land use, and urban growth. And Adam Thier, our moderator today, is a Senior Research Fellow at the Mercator Center at George Mason University. He specializes in innovation, entrepreneurialism, and the internet. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Of course. And with that, Adam, I'll pass things over to you. Well, thank you, Jack. And I am really excited to be joined here by Mark Scribner today. For many years now, Mark has been my go-to source for all things planes, trains, and automobiles related. Um, He's really one of the nation's leading experts on emerging transportation technologies, whether on the ground or in the sky. So I'm, I'm excited about our conversation today. And what we're going to try to do is uh, bring our listeners up to speed with what's been happening on the uh, autonomous vehicle front uh, in recent years. Um, Mark has uh, recently authored a piece that I I saw on uh, Congress's failure to enact an automated vehicle regulatory framework is an opportunity for the states. And this built on two really excellent studies that Mark did. Uh, having to do with challenges and opportunities for federal automated vehicle policy, as well as another big study on 10 best practices for state automated vehicle policy. So, Mark, with that, let let me turn to you and ask you to kick off our conversation by asking you to take a step back and help our listeners understand how we got to the point we find ourselves in today. Uh, which is uh, America still stands in a position where we have no clear national policy framework for our autonomous vehicle systems. And I remember when when the two of us started covering this issue, gosh, I think it's been almost a decade now, um, we were writing about it during the Obama years. And shortly after that, bills started to be introduced in Congress, uh, AV Start, Self-Drive Act and others. And the consensus was that something was going to happen. I, I think I even believed that for a time. Um, and everybody else thought it would be a slam dunk. But here we are now in 2022, and many years and several sessions of Congress have passed, and yet we still don't have a national policy framework for driverless cars. So, Mark, why can't Congress get AV legislation over the goal line? Well, that's a that's a great question, Adam. And uh, as you said, there was a lot of momentum several years ago in the 115th Congress in uh, 2017, 2018. There really seemed like something was going to happen. As you said, um, you know, we had uh, uh, maybe a slam dunk definitely in the House, the Self-Drive Act passed by voice vote. And then it ran into problems in the Senate with the companion bill. And it really doesn't seem to have much to do with policy differences. And in speaking with with staff on both sides of the aisle, I think everyone sort of understands what needs to get done. What are the high priority items? um, What can be done today, given the sort of state of technical standardization, just general knowledge on the tech of the technology, um, but uh, it is it's it's emerged there are um, uh, a, a few interest groups who are uh, who are very much opposed to some of the potential um, uh, outcomes uh, as that they that they see as as, as uh, with with these bills. Um, namely, you've got unions who are concerned about. Um, uh, lost driver jobs in the future if this technology, you know, uh, impacts the labor market as 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 most people expect it eventually will. Um, and then you have uh, trial lawyers um, who have made shifting demands, but uh, one thing they've definitely wanted over time is an explicit prohibition on 
uh, arbitration clauses in future customer contracts. So, you know, no one's really written these contracts yet because we don't really have deployment of this technology, certainly not at scale. Um, but those are the two main interest groups um, that have held this up. So it's really, it's less policy, it's more politics um, right now. And we've been at this impasse uh, you know, since the 115th Congress. And, and right now, the, the current makeup of Congress, this doesn't seem to be a priority. So probably not this Congress, maybe next Congress, we're going to see some movement on this, but I'm not holding my breath. So, yeah, this is astonishing to me. And I, I, I note that last May, a top official from the AFL-CIO testified in front of Congress and told them that driverless trucks uh, quote, place millions of jobs at risk. And uh, he demanded that Congress exempt trucks, trucks from any legislation having to do with self-driving vehicles. I found that kind of astonishing, given that at this, in the same breath, he was talking about a nationwide shortage of drivers. And then second of all, uh, there's been an ongoing push for uh, road safety in this and other administrations. And of course, truck safety is first among those issues because of the huge toll that uh, accidents take on, on the nation's uh, interstate highway system in terms of truck uh, accidents. So it, it just doesn't seem to make any sense. It doesn't add up. And yet still, that is that interest and the, the trial lawyers seem to be blocking advancement of it. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, is there even legislation moving at all anymore in Congress? I think uh, one of the two bills was introduced, but I don't know if the other one was. Is that right? Uh, yeah, there was there was briefly there's been some sort of half hearted symbolic efforts to basically reintroduce what was introduced a few years ago. Um, there was a serious effort that never got off the ground to kind of do a what they were calling a skinny AV bill that focused on on fewer matters than than the um, the AV start and self drive acts uh, from the from the 115th Congress did. Um, but yeah, nothing has happened on that. The last big opportunity would have been surface transportation reauthorization, which was included as part of the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the big infrastructure law. Um, but that it didn't make it into the safety title there either. So, yeah, right now it's 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 really, you know, we're going to ha probably have to see a new Congress um, right. and really some, you know, to shake things up. Um, and see what happens because the you know the areas or the 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 logical vehicles legislative vehicles um, where you would expect to see this kind of legislation um, they've kind of we we've, we've passed them by right so in in light of that uh, uh, let's talk about what's happened in the regulatory environment then and stay focused uh, at, for the moment at the federal level uh, and I want to ask you a two part question about what's been happening at the Department of Transportation uh, over the past few years uh, in light of this. Uh, sort of legislative vacuum in Congress. So for better or for worse, at the DOT, we've seen a lot of so-called soft law guidances and announcements to fill the, the governance gap le left by congressional inaction. So one part of the question I'd have to you is to, when you highlight what's been happening at DOT, uh, to talk about for better or for worse, the the rise of soft law as a sort of uh, governance norm for AVs. And then second, is this question about a lot of people have been hinting that the Biden administration is going to get tough with uh, a lot of AV makers and companies, and, and in particular with one company and, and innovator in particular, that would be Elon Musk and Tesla. And so there's been a lot of chatter recently about that because one of Musk's biggest critics was appointed to a position at NHTSA within the Department of Transportation. And so maybe the Biden administration is going to take a different path than the Obama and Trump, uh, especially Trump, did with a sort of more uh, soft law and formal pronouncement. So uh, answer that two part question about what's been happening in the regulatory uh, community. So you're 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 absolutely right, and and you've and you've written a lot on the the subject of soft law and how it applies to to AVs, uh, particularly at the federal level, and I, I see that persisting for at least a bit longer, just because if you look at the at the rulemaking pipeline, if you look at the uniform agenda of of regulatory and deregulatory actions, um, you see some some future activities on the horizon, most notably an, an, an occupant protection. Uh, for automated driving systems, uh, equipped vehicles that uh, was basically fully baked at the end of the Trump administration. And then it was subject to additional review for the last year. That looks like it may be coming out um, in, fe in scheduled February 
2022. So that would be the first thing to potentially move. And that what that would do, it was it would, it would update an existing regulation um, that would allow um, some uh, novel vehicle types. Um, there's a company called Neuro, for instance, that, you know, proposes to do last mile delivery with uh, with a, uh, a small vehicle that, you know, you wouldn't even have a person driving it or riding in it ever. Um, so it shouldn't be subject to the kinds of occupant protection requirements that a passenger vehicle would be. So, so th- those are the kind of kind of regulatory housekeeping things we eventually want the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to get through. And we might be seeing that soon. But but, you know, as you've written about soft law, the guidance um, uh, documents that have been basically made up what federal automated vehicle policy is since since. 2013, uh, the Obama administration, that's, we're likely to see that a a bit further. On the question of, you know, is the Biden administration going to get tough? Maybe. Uh, But what that means, is it going to get uniformly tough? That I think, uh, uh, you know, remains to be seen, even if they do get tough, because uh, as you mentioned, um, you know, Elon Musk and Tesla uh, have been very controversial in this space. Tesla is is unique among automated vehicle de- developers in that uh, it, it is not doing the it is it, it, it's rolling out progressively higher auto, levels of automation or at least that's its plan to end consumers. Whereas you know all the other developers are basically focused on in much more controlled testing with fleet vehicles, whether that's for freight or passenger. Think Waymo, uh, uh, formerly known as the the Google self driving car project, uh, or the the efforts by major automakers like uh, Aurora and Ford. Uh, and uh, GM crews, um, who tend to be, although there were some recent announcements from GM that maybe that may be changing, but by and large, those are much more controlled releases of higher automation technology, not uh, phasing in from an advanced driver assistance system, which is what Tesla has been doing. So, you know, on the, you mentioned that the appointment of Missy Cummings as a as a senior advisor at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, she has been very critical of Tesla's approach, but hardly alone in that criticism. Um, like I said, the, the, her position is not much different from uh, every other automaker uh, or developer of this technology. But I think you, we have seen the, the most concrete action was summer 2021, we saw NHTSA put out a, uh, a standing general order, which is a, a pre-enforcement action uh, to collect data uh, on crashes involving automated vehicles. And the thing is, it didn't just focus on Tesla, where there have been some notable crashes and, and fatal crashes involving uh, or potentially involving autopilot, Tesla autopilot being engaged at the time of the crash. It covered all automated vehicles, including those, those um, companies that are you know, testing this on public roads with safety drivers or in much otherwise much more controlled settings. And I think that I think you saw the tension that had been that had been growing uh, between Tesla and everyone else in the auto industry boil over because now they are subject to this reporting requirement uh, that likely is is 90 percent aimed at Tesla. Tesla and probably would not have been probably would not have been issued if not for Tesla's behavior. So there's definitely some uh, uh, yeah, not a lot of 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 of, of uh, happiness among the uh, Tesla's competitors right now. And and so we're, we're seeing that. So, you know, it's it's an interesting dynamic because, like I said, it's Tesla versus the world sort of right now. So right. you may even see some of those traditional automakers or other developers uh, acquiesce or if not support more, you know, hard law regulation. Yeah. So let me ask you a question I got just recently when I was talking to some law students and um, several of them were Federalist Society members. And I, I was asked when I was talking about these issues by one student, you know, how is it that Tesla gets away with this? Why aren't they in violation of federal motor vehicle safety standards? And, you know, they're they're just behaving, you know, uh, sort of going around the system. It's what I call in my most recent book, uh, evasive entrepreneurialism. They're sort of actively evading or at least kind of steering clear, excuse the pun, uh, from traditional uh, regulatory requirements. Is, is that accurate? And if it is accurate, um, how, how is that working? How is that playing out? 
Well, so the United States is somewhat unique in how it's compared to the rest of the world anyway, and how its regulatory system, auto safety regulatory system works in that it, it, it depends on self-certification to minimum safety and performance standards. Much of the world, our peer countries in Europe and Asia, um, and, and really every, uh, everywhere except North America, uh, by and large, uh, they have a a, uh, a regime called type certification, which is basically pre-market approval. So you have a, an auto safety regulator pull a production vehicle off the line and ensure that it meets these requirements. Here you, you have uh, manufacturers part suppliers basically saying they meet these minimum requirements. And as long as they are not making required safety features um, inoperative, um, they're in they're in compliance. So you know you don't now Tesla has done certain things where you know you've seen you've seen uh, recalls recently over the uh, they ha- had a game in their uh, in their uh, center console uh, yeah. uh, screen, which probably not a great idea and potentially put them uh, push them out of compliance. Um, but that is you know for better or for worse that's how our regulatory system works, and I'm inclined to think it's 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 generally better because it allows for much more experimentation. Uh, then would be the case, um, right. you know, under a type approval regime. But and at the same time, so it's, you should point out that it's bolstered by a recall regime if things do go are found to go wrong. A- absolutely, there are still yes. N- the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has robust enforcement powers. Um, you know, as we said, even if they uh, suspect something's up, you know, that that standing general order I mentioned was pretty bizarre. The last time NHTSA had used that. They did it in a much more methodical way, and it was with the Takata airbags that were exploding, um, which was a much more, uh, you know, uh, a serious hazard at the time. So, you know, NHTSA has quite a bit of latitude in its pretty expansive enforcement powers. So, you know, this t- sometimes people are saying that NHTSA's hands are tied here. I don't think that's the case at all, but they do have to show that there is, you know, good cause for them uh, to to bring enforcement actions. And you know, maybe we will see. They're they're currently, you know, the investigation is underway. There's, I mean, multi parts to this investigation now. Maybe we'll see more enforcement actions. Uh, but the fact that they, you know, have to go through some procedural hoops is not is a is a feature, not a bug. Right. So that's that's a good overview. Of what's happening at the federal level, or maybe whether what maybe isn't happening at the federal level. And given that we do have a bit of a a continuing legislative vacuum and sort of a piecemeal approach at the DOT, a lot of the action has shifted to the states. And you wrote about this recently in a major report and uh, talked about sort of the resulting state efforts that we're seeing play out. So I want to ask you about sort of what best practices should guide or are guiding already uh, the development of AV policy at the state level. And, you know, Federalist Society has always been very actively involved in pushing for potential devolution or federalism-based solutions where possible. And I can see upside here, but I can also see some downsides. So why don't you give us an overview of what's happening and also, as you do so, maybe the best of what's happening and the worst of what's happening. Sure. So the... Uh Auto safety regulation, like we, we generally think of the, the 70 Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards that the, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, administers, um, but the states uh, play a very important role in, in the regulation of motor vehicles and, and long have. Um, you know, states are the ones who are responsible for, for registration, for driver licensing, uh, for liability determination, uh, and insurance. All of those things play a big role in, in in how vehicles operate uh, and and ultimately are are, are used in, in society. So um, the states definitely have a role. Um, my general approach is for those traditional divisions of responsibilities between the various levels of government, basically keep those the same. Uh, don't need to reinvent the wheel here. States are very good at certain aspects and the federal government is very good at certain aspects. Um, and uh, those two should not switch places, uh, in my view. Um, so I, I've made a number of recommendations and in the report you mentioned, I, I have 
10. Um, I've, I've shortened that to four, uh, what I think are the most important of those 10. Um, and number one is adopt a standard vocabulary, um, which uh, by which I mean use uh, standard definitions from uh, SAE International, uh, formerly the Society of Automotive Engineers, uh, and the purpose of that standard uh, and to use those terms uh, is to ensure that lawyers and engineers uh, can talk to each other and are uh, uh, mutually intelligible. Um, number two is a very, very important housekeeping item, uh, but states have pretty extensive motor vehicle codes, um, a, a lot of which uh, mirror existing federal requirements. So there's uh, potential for some conflict there over time. But really what states need to do, just like the feds have done in recent years, is to audit those, um, those equipment codes, vehicle codes for potential conflicts with automated driving systems. Um, you know, there's, there's some of them are specific to automated driving systems. So, you know, if you've got a, you, if you've got a, um, occupantless, uh, last mile delivery vehicle, fully automated where you can't have someone seated there, you probably shouldn't have a requirement for pedals, for steering wheels, for seat belts, all of those sorts of things. Uh, but even electric vehicles, a lot of state, state codes have muffler requirements, which don't make a lot of sense in the context of, of an EV, even automated or not. Um, so doing those kinds of things, uh, and we've seen uh, uh, Florida so far is the only state that has actually uh, attempted to address that problem by uh, by basically um, uh, enacting a law that said if these if these requirements don't make sense in the context of an uh, of an automated vehicle, well, they don't apply. Um, I think further 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 on, you're going to probably want to uh, you know better develop that, be a bit more specific. Um, but I think that that suits its purpose for now. Um, uh, the third, I would say, distinguish between vehicle types. You know, a, a multi-ton highway vehicle, uh, SUV, um, has a very different risk profile than what it's basically a golf cart. Um, and that's sort of what um, Neuro's last last uh, mile delivery vehicles are. They're a uh, classified as a low speed vehicle under federal law. Um, and uh, so Florida has also taken the lead on that issue. Uh, last year, they created a new regulatory class called low speed autonomous delivery vehicle um, that uh, allowed for these non occupied AVs weighing less than 3000 pounds and uh, traveling under 25 miles an hour um, to be subject to uh, uh, fewer requirements than is that is generally required of of highway vehicles. And then the last of the, the four um, is is avoiding questionable legal framework. Works. Um, you know, I think uh, when it comes to for soft law, for instance, I think that serves a very valuable purpose in the interim before before policymakers can sort of figure out how to actually modernize their their vehicle codes or whatever um, to to accommodate these the, these new technologies. Um, but you saw some states, I think, getting a little cute with that, taking guidance documents, taking executive orders, and using those in place of regulation and legislation, binding private parties, compelling them to do certain things, which is not the purpose of those those tools. So I, I much prefer that uh, if you're going to force people to do something, uh, that you go through the, the, uh, the proper uh, uh, channels for that uh, traditional legislation and regulation. And yeah. you've seen a state where Arizona, for instance, stood up their, their regime, their initial automated vehicle regime through executive orders. Well, last year, they basically codified that whole thing. The legislature signed off on it. Those are the kinds of practical steps that I think could be taken immediately. So you mentioned some of the sort of more enlightened approaches, uh, Florida, uh, maybe Texas, maybe now Arizona, I think you in your report talked to, about Georgia doing some interesting things. But tell us briefly just a few states, and I'm just going to go ahead and throw them out there for you because I know you do highlight them in your report, uh, that are doing some maybe some boneheaded things. And I'm thinking New York and California. And then also tell us what that's meant for the market because clearly New York and especially California can really drive national policy in a big way given this, the scale of their markets. So tell us about what's happening there briefly. 
Yeah, New York was sort of a unique situation because they had a very unique vehicle code that um, that required one hand or prosthetic device to be on the steering wheel uh, at all times during operations. So that that posed some unique challenges that I don't think the the authors of that law uh, had had foreseen when they when they put that into the code years ago. Um, so the, the, New York was always an interesting case, but they they've done things like um, th- you know. Uh, they're letting New York City, I think, drive too much of the policy discussion there. Um, and they're not, uh, I, I guess, being as welcoming uh, as they could, in part because I think they have they have concerns with uh, and, and perhaps unique and legitimate concerns that, with with, you know, the, the higher densities of Manhattan. Uh, but I think there's some protectionism going on there that uh, is all too common. Uh, in that state requiring uh, sort of the the testing the, or testing on public roads um, with uh, with restrictions that you don't even see in California. Um, and then to, to the California point, I think they, you know, they are, they're well-meaning. Uh, I will say that because the, the, they they were first movers on this, on this, um, in attempting to regulate this technology to explicitly authorize testing had strong endorsements. They signed their original, the original AV legislation into law back in 2012 at Google headquarters with the founders looking on. So it's, you know, I, I think there's some well-meaning people there, but I think they've 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 gone too far in excessive regulation uh, without um, necessarily paying attention to unintended consequences. One example would be their disengagement reporting requirement. So anytime uh, the automated driving system in one of these vehicles that's that's operating on the roads disengages, they've got to log that and provide that information to the state, which is then p- made publicly available. And the problem with that is, and especially because it's, it's publicly available, uh, it provides some bad incentives. So if you want to have a low disengagement rate. Well, uh, what do you do? You do all the easy testing. You go to places where uh, you have wide open roads uh, in the suburbs, perhaps, rather than rather than downtown San Francisco, um, where you have those 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 trickier edge cases where you really want to get a handle on those before you actually start doing wider scale deployment. And, and frankly, you know, at least if you're looking at Potential business models that the kind of the taxi style AVs remains, I think, one of the most promising, and that has you know uh, a disproportionate value in dense urban cores as opposed right. to suburbs and exurbs, let alone rural areas. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it was poorly intentioned there, but that just you know the you know what they say about the the. the good intentions and, and the right. roads they, they pave. They only get you so far. Uh, <laughs> so uh, related to that, you do mention that some innovators have moved, have, you know, innovation arbitrage has sort of kicked in and like, moving around, at least out of California. Anybody in particular who's, you know, I mean, Tesla, anybody else? Well, you saw, uh, you did see a lot of testing. Now, some of them have moved back into California and they're doing some testing, but that's why you saw a lot of the growth in testing and, and early deployment in the Phoenix East Valley, Valley in Arizona. Um, those were, these are California based companies. You're seeing a lot of, uh, you mentioned Texas. Texas is another light touch state. Um, that's where you're seeing long haul trucking. Uh, 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 technologies uh, being tested. Now, part of that is the the weather makes is uh, makes those suitable test grounds. They don't have to deal with snow or really any form of precipitation. Um, but um, you know, it, it, certainly the regulatory, the welcoming regulatory environment played a role, um, and that's why you know you really see the uh, you know. Phoenix East Valley is still really the, the the only place where you can hail a uh, a, a fully self driving vehicle um, and use it like a, a ride hailing uh, so, uh, so, car. So, Mark, speaking of welcoming welcoming regulatory environment, I want to ask you to close on this point because we only got a few minutes left. Because we've talked about the federal level, we've talked about the state level, but of course, cars are a global business. And there are a lot of places to develop cars and a lot of great innovators across the globe. So uh, capital often flocks to where it's treated most hospitably and innovation can too. So are there any other models in any other countries um, that are 
ahead of America's that are better than America's, conversely, that are radically worse? Um, how will this play out? And I, I ask you to say this in just a few short minutes we have left here. I, I would say, uh, you know, we're, we've seen probably more, we've seen more national activity, particularly, you know, uh, UK, uh, Germany have been much more active on national regulatory frameworks uh, than the United States is. However, I don't necessarily think that uh, that they are in a better position um, uh, because, like like I mentioned, uh, the the U.S. and North America is pretty unique that we have our self certification regime. And while you know the kind of type approval or pre market approval uh, might, there could be benefits there for for developers in that it tends to provide a better liability shield than our. Uh, federal self-certification auto safety regime, but um, that's about it. So I, I think the self-certification is generally um, preferable. But um, you know, if Congress doesn't act, um, and we see more and more company or countries um, moving and taking the concrete steps that need to be taken in order to fully integrate these technologies into our our auto uh, uh, safety regulatory ecosystems. I think you will longer term uh, see more attention shift abroad. Great. Well, that's about all we have time for today on today's show. But before we close, I want to encourage all of our listeners to subscribe to this podcast on whatever podcasting platform they most enjoy. And I want to ask all of you to follow Mark on social media. Uh, Mark, where's the best place for people to find you online? Uh, you can find me at, at reason.org. And then on Twitter, I am Mark, Mark with a C, Scribner. Uh, you can find me there uh, regularly tweeting about automation and other transportation issues. <laughs> Indeed. I, I encourage all of our listeners to, to follow Mark. He's a font of knowledge on this front and, uh, and we'll continue this conversation there. So, Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me, Adam. Yeah. And I'll turn it back to Jack to uh, close things out. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today. I think our listeners will really appreciate the, the update on this really interesting space. And Adam, where can our listeners find you on Twitter and elsewhere? They can find me at Twitter at, at Adam Thier. And of course, they can go to the Mercatus uh, website and find all my uh, related writings there. Great. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to this episode of RTP's Tech Roundup podcast. As Adam noted, you can subscribe on any major podcast platform and check out our website, regproject.org, or our social media accounts at FedSocRTP to learn more. Thank you. On behalf of the Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project, thanks for tuning in to the Fourth Branch podcast. To catch every new episode when it's released, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spreaker. For the latest from RTP, please visit our website at regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 